Hey, it's me again. This video is part two of my Uncle From Another World series, so check out the previous video if you missed it. I've put a playlist somewhere here if you want to use that. Anyway, when we last left off, Fujimiya attempts to suggest that Oji-san become a baseball player, stating that he could cheat using his magic. Ji-san is an honorable man who understands the hard work put in by professionals and does not wish to drag their dedication through the mud with his wizardly powers. This is understandable. The planet is moistened, and the discussion of baseball reminds Oji-san of the time he was nearly assassinated. The youths are startled, but he continues. Late one night, in a forest, Oji-san was approached by a familiar hooded figure Figure, which Takafumi points out. It's Mabel, whose chilly sword has become a scythe to reap a frigid vengeance. She pounces upon ojirino san but doesn't seem overly keen to actually kill him. Oji-san recognizes Naple and figures she just wants to talk, and so she does, revealing that her lifelong duty to protect the frozen sword was undone, and her existence is now meaningless. I assume the village kicked her out for being a bum. Oji-san doesn't pick up on her sarcasm and yells back at her, much to the youngin's sudden overwhelming distress. Murple readies her blade, farming tool, sharp thing, and prepares to strike. However, Oji-san doesn't feel killing intent from those crazed orbs, and asks if she is eating well. Mabel most definitely isn't, and has a mental breakdown before passing out. And so Oji-san drags her to a nearby inn, and gives her a tasty loaf. They discuss her living situation, which was pretty much exactly as I said earlier, except the mayor wanted to enslave Mabel. Takafuji Mifumi reflects on this. Mabel ultimately decided to torment the villagers with water torture, which makes sense. Oji-san is impressed with her tenacity to individually torture 108 villagers, but Mabel definitely can't go home now, and clearly doesn't want to work in such harsh conditions, as displayed here. Oji-san relates, then states that he's able to support himself as an adventurer. It's a decent paying gig which allows him to work on finding a way back to his world. Marble is impressed, giving Oji-san the go-ahead to brag about beating alien soldier in 30 minutes. This confuses her, but this other world he speaks of sparks her curiosity. She is interrupted by Uncle, suggesting that she use the God Freezing Sword to make cash. Mabel isn't so sure about abusing the power of her family's sword, but Oji-san gives her the same advice as before. It's her life, and she should be able to do what she wants. She is inspired twice over, and figures that finding a way to break the seal of ice would be a good start. The flower blossom she requested previously didn't do anything to aid that, so her next bet would be to fix her gloomy personality. Oji-san compliments her introvertedness, which helped cracks the seal a little. Mabel tries to cling to her darkness, but Oji-san compliments her further. The sword is fixin' to bust out. Our boy went and did it again. He now has acquired a second wife, whom he forced into marriage while she slept. Here's the reaction shot. Table trips over a few words, then attempts to reject Oji-san as her sword turns into a puddle. Oji-san insists that he help her with finances, and their divorce was short-lived. Mabel is incapable of comprehending this circumstance, while Oji-san keeps insisting that she accept his gift. Any Anyway, it's getting late, so she may as well stay the night. Despite there being a small, singular bed, Babel seems to have at least come to terms with the situation, and requests that she have some time to bathe. She is aggressively smelled up by Oji-san, who finds no wrong, but suggests that she sell the ring first to avoid the bathing fee. This statement completely remakes the seal of ice in an atomic nanosecond, causing Mabel to go feral with primal rage. Oji-san senses the urge to kill, and springs into action. The clattering summons Elf, who is eager to just see him, but brings a pillow, just in case. Hmm. Well, um, I guess, um, he had to restrain Mabel. This doesn't look so good. Oji-san tries to get Elf to help, but she spots the glimmering of a Cosmolite ring. Oji-san begs to be spared, as Elf slices through his magical piss chains. He dies. The ladies exchange knowing looks, and that's how Oji-san was almost assassinated. He gets no amnesty from the kids, but Takafumi turns the vibe around by complimenting his uncle on beating that game in 30 minutes. This causes him to ramble, while Taco Fumes looks up the current speedrun time. 12 minutes. Oji-san dies. He curses the internet, then they discuss English translations on games. The memory continues in the background, as Fuji watches on. Mabel and Elf discuss Oji-san's origin, and how perhaps, like Mabel's descendants, are from the same world, Japan. 
Fudgy is shook. They all gather around to have a little rewind and witness Elf consoling Mabel about being forcefully wed to Orcface. Mabel is fine though. Elf notices that she might be a little too okay with this and asks why. Label says that Oji-san might be from Japan, then starts doing some Disney theatrics while reciting the history of her people. Her ancestor died in a samurai war, reincarnated standard isekai style, and was given the cool sword by God. Takafumi reflects on this. Elf interrupts Mabel's monologuing by summarizing the story. Samurai fell in love, undid the frosty part of the sword, and slew the blaze dragon. Gable quivers and shook while Elf inquires about her relationship with Orkfaith. Unfortunately, Mabel spent too long practicing that recitation, only to have Elf interrupt. This causes her to crumble. Elf fervently apologizes, unsure of what to do exactly. Oji-san suddenly interrupts with fury at God for not giving him a cool sword. Takafumi figures he should have got something at least, and suggests that they look back to when he was transferred. Oji-san proceeds to rewind through 18 years of mobs, lynchings, hangings, executions, etc., until eventually stumbling across the moment he emerged into existence. He didn't get to talk to God, and was harassed immediately by adventurers who he couldn't communicate with. Fuji Mio Yogurt hears a faint voice, so Oji-san cranks the volume, finding that God is speaking Korean. Oji-san couldn't hear anyway because he was being ravaged by the natives. Takafumi proceeds to do a Google Translate, finding that the pre-recorded robot God voice was asking what powers Oji-san wants. He must have been given whatever he was thinking then, which Takafumi enthusiastically ponders. Uncle just wanted to be able to talk to his aggressors and was given the gift of translation. God proceeds to tell him to go to Mount Dordo for minimum knowledge. And so Oji-san was able to speak, live another day, sold to a freak show as a rare orc with human intelligence and totally unaware that there is a god. He costs three copper coins. Takafumi requests that they take a break, and so they do. Back in the memory, upon selling Oji-san for three pennies, the adventurers also sell off a random brush for 120 pennies. This is apparently news to Uncle and Takafumi, who received nosebleeds due to the effects of relearning a memory which was erased. Fuji learns about this and peeps in the notebook of despair. And so, Oji-san is now a member of a freak show, which exhibits exotic beasts. He skips forward a week due to being forgotten about. Oji-san suckled on a puddle to survive, and began talking to a single ray of light to remain sane. The one-sided conversation about Pulse Man's Volsikar move navigates towards a comparison to the beauty of the ray of moonlight, which is thankful for the compliment. The spirit of light, Kilgid, bequeathed upon Oji-san the ancient magical words to harness its power, and so Uncle acquired a sword of light, which he used to escape. Tarkov reflects on the previous memories where Oji-san communed with the spirits to accomplish stuff. It never occurred to Oji that his magic was of a spiritual nature, because he just assumed that it was an autodidactic acquisition of knowledge from his honed adaptability from video games. The circus animals all noticed a chance to escape, guilt-tripping Oji-san into beginning a rebellion. His animal friends were actually vicious beasts, and once set free, decided to eviscerate any human they saw, including Oji-san. In a Sega-focused panic, Oji-san obliterates his assailants, rescues his former master, and faces off against the overwhelming army of ferocious animals till dawn, after which he enjoyed a lavish feast of various exotic monsters, sending them gracefully into the afterlife. This scene causes Oji-san to wistfully reminisce about his excellent start. The youths are shook. His only complaint is that he was sold for less than a used brush. Fuji begins to peace out in light of the fried chicken waiting at home, but Oji-san accidentally lures them back into the memories with the meeting of Elf. No fried chicken for Fujit, but the battle with the Venom Dragon proceeds, and it's over. Fujimiya laments her lack of chicken, but Takafumi remains impressed at his uncle's prowess. He reassures his nephew that it was luck which saved the day, as Elf had already injured the dragon enough to reveal a weak point that Oji-san exploited. Elf is shook mistaking him for an orc, but he gives her his jacket to cover up and insists that he is human. She gives him her gratitude, then draws a dagger, prepared to slay the grotesque demon before her. She regains composure, apologizes, then sheathes her blade. Unfortunately, Oji-san had never seen dimensional storage and assumed that she had stabbed herself. He goes to investigate, completely disregarding that elf is totally nude. She resists, but Oji-san is persistent. He finds no sign of injury and only backs off after being attacked. Elf unleashes a 
barrage of insults aimed at his visage, calling him a perverted orc and beginning to sunder Ray. Unsure of what to do, Oji-san decides the best option is to stay silent and endure the berating. So that's when Elf's pestering began. Speaking of which, back to the assassination attempt. The morning after being frozen in ice, he awakens to find his wives sprawled across his bed. Elf defends herself with a thinly veiled cultural excuse, but Oji-san believes her. She is elated as he figures that since it's cold, they may as well sleep in. Mabel secures the prime position, however, calling out to her mother in her sleep. She so longingly does not wish to work, reciting the tragedy of her whore mother who abandoned her to elope with some guy. Elf uses her karate to jar marbles from her nightmare, after which Mabel attempts to defend herself by stating she wishes to work, despite trembling uncontrollably. Oji-san once again suggests that she sell the ring. Elf also suggests this, but Mabel is conflicted. Oji-san puts everything else aside, assigns Libel's care to Obasan Elf, and they get breakfast. Since none of them actually know each other, they do introductions. Mabel's is self-explanatory. Elf doesn't give her name, but states that her mission is to find and gather ancient relics, and Oji-san introduces himself as Wolf Gunblood, whose main goal is to find his way back home. Despite knowing Elf for three years now, Oji-san figured that it would be best not to give out his real name to strangers. The kids reflect on this, then Elf states that she is headed to the town where she sold her ring. Fiji Tacos figures that she feels threatened by Mabel and wants to purchase her wedding ring back. Wolf Gun Blood decides to go investigate a nearby dungeon where a hero is said to be rummaging around. Elf reveals him rumors about a hero of legendary strength who single-handedly slayed a horde of Legion-class beasts. Mabel wants to go with Oji-san, but her otaku lifestyle will make timely travel nearly impossible, and so their fated party immediately disbanded. Fujimiya regrets not partaking in the fried chicken, but Oji-san offers that they get some ramen instead. He was a little short on money, so Fiji had to cover his town, but they enjoyed the meal nevertheless. Elf uses her toes to pick up her hat, while Oji-san attempts to reacquire his jacket. She refuses, so Oji-san restrains her with his lascivious piss chains. Elf tricks him into undoing the shackles, and totally incapacitated him. Takafumi is exasperated by the entire situation. Oji-san never got his hoodie back, but received Elf's iconic sheer dress instead, which they both decide Fujimiya should try out. It looks good on her, but reminds Oji-san of Elf, causing him to feel a little nostalgic. Later, they come up with a cool name for Uncle's translation skill, deciding on Wild Talker. Oji-san's suggestion was lame, I guess. Suddenly, Fuji must away to do some stuff at college, leaving Takafumil rather dazed. I think she forgot her phone. Oji-san does some sick moves in a new game he purchased, which reminds him of the time when he saved a village from a horde of goblins with a team of adventurers. After thoroughly trouncing them in battle and being recognized from a previous encounter of the same ferocity, they introduce each other. The ladies' companions are hesitant, but they team up anyway. The horde of goblins turns out to be an army of goblins, but Oji-san has a cunning plan and proceeds to engage his lure into pitfall strat, which doesn't work. As a fallback, the downward thrust attack from Golden Axe should do the trick, and so he proceeds to gracefully leap into the air and whiff every strike. Impressive as it is, what really did the business was the resulting panicked swipe of frustration which felled an entire mountain, the after effects of which obliterated the goblins. Tracheotomy points out that his uncle's Sega wisdom in fact made the situation worse, which falls on deaf ears as Oji-san fervently defends his precious knowledge. After all that, the adventurers head back to town. Oji-san doesn't want to get on their bad side and allows them to share a four-way split on the reward. They all laugh about it while Takafumi reflects on his uncle's new friends. The cleric girl secretly mentions the Luvaldrum barrier situation, in awe of Oji-san's power, but this activates the autistic sleeper agent within him, leading to the instant erasing of all of their memories involving him. Takafumi is no longer surprised, but this isn't the last time Oji-san and this party meet. In another circumstance, after their traditional greeting and a deja vu moment, they introduce themselves again. Oji-san uses another alias, then gets down to business. An old shrine has become a lair for a monster hedgehog. Of course, Oji-san knows all about hedgehogs from his late nights with Sonic and intends to befriend it. Through sheer willpower and determination to speak amiably with Sonic, anything is possible. 
that's no hedgehog. Oji-san is disappointed, but he still wishes to converse, asking why the Hoj Hedge has been killing humans. He connects telepathically with it, translating the beast's words. It just enjoys killing for pleasure. Oji-san unleashes a blast of violent hellfire upon the demonic creature, and that was his first time speaking with an animal. He proceeds to inquire about a hero nearby. When Fudrit's phone makes its presence known, Takis must deliver this precious lifeline to his friend immediately, and gets Oji-san to fly him to her college. They have a look, finding a suspicious scene. Some punk is harassing his girl, and Takafumi must steal himself for battle. If the man is right for her, then there is nothing to be done. But Tapir Poopy must go see for himself first. As reassurance, Oji-san hooks his nephew up with some temporary spiritual powers, then asks what will be done if things go awry. Takafumi intends to erase his opponent's memories and speeds off. The dialogue between the suspicious pairing could be easily misconstrued as harassment and they run into Takafumi, who is neglecting to hide his aura. He recognizes the red-haired punk as Chiaki, Fuji's little brother, who struggles to remember Tako at first, then suddenly sees the resemblance. It's been a while. Somehow, Chiaki is in fourth grade, despite being a mongoloid. I guess this type of growth runs in the family. He's visiting Sumine to do some YouTube stuff. Uncle shows up just in time to talk with the little YouTuber as a professional. Their union must be a fated event. As Oji-san approaches with an introduction, he's in instantly rejected as a nobody. The two tubers discuss games, but Chalky doesn't know what Sega Saturn is, so they shift to YouTube-related things. While Fujimiya confronts Takafumi about his menacing aura, he reveals his concern that Fiji Meter may have acquired an unruly boyfriend. She is shook, but Takafurnicus figures that it wouldn't be surprising due to her radiant cuteness. Tape Farmer was concerned about her safety and just got ahead of himself. He reveals the powers recently acquired from Ojizan by making holograms of himself and Fuji, turning invisible, then teleporting away. Fujimiya is in awe of his prowess, but Takafumi spent his childhood reading light novels and contemplating the use of magic, so he has essentially mastered it already. Later, they discuss a time in grade school when Takafumi rescued her from a pack of wild bullies, but he remembers differently. Luckily, there is an easy way to check, so they do. Looks like Fujimiya was back at it again with her freakish strength and threatening personality, but they both got the wrong idea of the situation. The the actual truth is slightly more jarring than their idealistic memories. Either way, Fujimiya was flattered and begins to flirt. Suddenly, a friend of hers walks in on their intimate moment, which gives Taco the go-ahead to introduce himself and add to the securing of Funky's safety. He's a little too concerned about her safety, probably, but is scolded. The phone be ringing, though, and they must return to Chiaka. Later, back home, the three discuss the activating conditions of Oji-san's ability, deciding on desperation as one of them, which begs the question of how he gain ties with the Japanese spirits. Takafumi was giving off a sinister aura with his fancy government paperwork, which led Oji-san to make an enthusiastic attempt at creating magic. Anyway, the story involving the hero isn't done yet. Uncle was asking about the location of the hero, which prompts the cleric, Alicia, to take up Sword Boy's sword and announce herself as the hero chosen by fate, the shining crusader, Alicia Adelcia. Unfortunately, Alicia doesn't understand how to properly maintain a sword, and her companion has a mental breakdown. Spiky hair scolds her, and she apologizes, and that there is the legendary hero and her party, who have only been adventuring for about six months. Oji-san takes a look at their coronation ceremony to find that they repelled an army of goblins which threatened the whole kingdom. Huh. Of course, none of them remember what happened, and Oji-san begins to peace out. Alicia stops him to mention the Luvaldrum barrier incident. She manages to avoid losing her memories somehow, and they team up for a bit. Again. Their mission is to explore this insanely difficult labyrinth to fulfill their joint childhood dream of obtaining the legendary Wand of Salvation. Oji-san gets confirmation of this by forcefully projecting Albert's memories. She fawns over her diminutive simps, who aren't appreciative of this, but it's a pleasant scene. Upon entering the dungeon, Oji-san casts a series of elaborate spells, leading them directly to the exit and to the legendary wand. The team isn't exactly thrilled, and now their memories are wiped again. The process is just as dramatic. Oji-san wanted them to earn the wand properly, so they went at it again and feel fulfilled this time. Unfortunately, Uncle wasn't satisfied with his assistance in the matter and goes to wipe the slate clean once more, but after being sincerely thanked, can't bring himself to do so. The precious memories of their adventure are maintained, and Oji-san stoically disappears to the capital for some business. Not before receiving some Yu-Gi-Oh cards, though. And off he goes, with a smile. Oji-san was cool as heck there. Anyway, it's kind of hot today, and they have no 
AC. As a result, the three reflect on when most places didn't come equipped with AC and child abuse was rampant. Takafumi has a sudden traumatic flashback and instinctively wishes to continue viewing Oji-san's memories. Fuji reflects on this. Orc face terrifies the captain of the guard with his memory spell, revealing that the church has full authority to declare heroes and that the pope is meeting with the general right now. Oji-san thanks him and vanishes to go settle things with the church. For granting Alicia and her lads a title beyond their abilities, it would seem the nefarious duo are attempting to kill off the newly promoted heroes to acquire extra funds for military endeavors. Oji-san intervenes, unveiling the exact memory of when they knowingly sent the rookie adventurers to the goblin army. Oji-san delivers one of his most baller MC lines about defending the honor of the spirits of those who risked their lives and died for it. Takafumi identifies the trope of superior modern morals. However, the 20-year-old Oji-san was too young to have thought that deeply about this and flubbed his words. Since the situation was so dire, Oji-san decided that the best option would be to use forbidden transformation magic to metamorphose into the most powerful creature he knew, Tabuchi-sensei, his middle school homeroom teacher, whose combination of impassive glare, incomprehensible gibberish, and magisterial despotic slappy hands make for an incredible formidable being. The technique is so thoroughly effective that the general is instantly subdued. His impassioned underling goes to defend his honor, but receives the same treatment. Despite this, the general makes the counterpoint that the current military budget can no longer keep up with the increasing threats against the kingdom, citing the catastrophic events caused by Oji-san's various doings as reason for utmost caution. Even through Tabuchi sensei's ironclad debate skills, Oji-san could not bring himself to deliver another slap. Suddenly, Maybell shows up to do battle with her husband, her sword is a puddle. They have an intense wizard battle, but it was actually just an ice magic illusion, and they discuss how Mabel became a knight with benefits and everything. She has an extensive ego trip, which terrifies Takamiya. Mabel attempts to get Oji-san to throw the fight to achieve a pay raise and give him a knighthood. This does not satisfy wolf gun blood, however. She equates their fight to a game, which makes the situation worse, then attempts to be cute to save herself. Oji-san states that she is, of course, cute, but this causes their illusions to become 240p and in turn outs their charade. The general instantly suspects her of colluding with the dark orc and threatens her job security. Things get real, real readily as Mabel goes feral, lashing out at friend and foe alike. Oji-san shatters the mind control magic placed on her in a single precise strike, outing the Pope as a pervert for going to such lengths. Uncle proceeds to inspire the general, stating that by placing faith in his soldiers, he will surely find another way to handle the monster crisis. His comrades agree, but the general has already dirtied his hands. Suddenly, the visage of Tabushi sensei turns the tides in his heart, and his mind is swayed. The youths ponder Tabuchi sensei's prowess briefly. Oji-san begins to offer his help to protect the kingdom, but before he can, the general introduces himself as Ricardo. Oji-san almost comes up with a silly name, but goes with wolf gun blood instead. The Pope isn't so sure what one freak can do without a leash, but Oji-san transforms into the second most powerful creature he knew, the legendary Blaze Dragon. Everyone is shook. Oji-san tells Ricardo to apologize to the heroes, then flutters off into the distance. Unfortunately, Marble was still fired, and for some reason, Takafumi has developed scales. Uncle figures that Takafumi's shortening of incantations the other day probably frustrated the spirits, and so, to remedy this, Oji-san joins his nephew in joint reptilian camaraderie, and that's the end of part 2 of season 1 of Isekai Oji-san. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe, and stuff related to that. I think it helps the video, but YouTube is stupid sometimes. I have a Patreon if you want to feel distant gratitude. Uh... Thanks again. Bye.